Welcome to Nostalgia, your favorite pop culture podcast where we have deep conversations about superficial things. I'm Nicole, your host, and each week we unlock core memories from the 90s, 2000s, and beyond while examining the past through a contemporary lens. Our guests are pop culture tastemakers who explore how our formative experiences shape how we see the world. We talk about trends, fashion, music, identity, consumer behavior, societal attitudes, and more. Nostalgia is a reminder of how our individual and collective memories make us feel like we belong and if you like nostalgia be sure to follow subscribe rate review and share with a friend who loves pop culture as much as we do plus we have a lot of fun enjoy the show Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nostalgia. I am super excited to have Tom here today, my guest from Archive, which is an organization of members who curate a distributed collection of offline valuable cultural artifacts brought on chain. I'm very excited because I actually became a member of Archive the same day that they acquired the MTV VMA's Moon Man prototype. And I just feel like that is on brand, that is consistent. And I really love exploring this intersection of pop culture and nostalgia and Web3. So welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. This is like my favorite thing is to talk about. So this is the trifecta, bullseye, whatever it is. Let's, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I think that this niche is really cool. And I don't make the, well, I, maybe I do make the rules. I think that this niche has the most fun people too. And really being able to think about that thread of continuity between the past, present, and future because yeah. when I talk about nostalgia, it's not like, oh, the good old days, like everything was so much better that back then, like woe is us now, we have to be adults, whatever. It's really more so like cycles repeat, trend cycles repeat, and to be able to look at something that happened, draw inspiration from it, and then ultimately use that information and that knowledge to build the kind of future that you want, I yeah. think that's kind of where we're coming from. Totally. I mean, I, I, I look at it as, you know, there's a lot of things that define us and culture. I think that that has been, uh, in some cases, minimized. I think it gets, I think like it gets shuffled off into like pop or trendy or whatever. But then you get long enough back and you can start to see like how that actually created a, you know, a network or spidering out of a value that no one really anticipated. And you start looking at how objects, items, things of those of different time frames really do that. And that's kind of how we've been looking at it. We've been looking at that from the perspective of, of fine art. We've been looking at that from contemporary. We've been looking at that from specific objects tied to technology and culture and, and sometimes the emergence and, and overlap of both. Uh, and yeah, I, th I think it's meaty and, and something that you can explore basically forever uh, as you start to stratify into different segments, right? So. Um, I'm really excited to, 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 to be working on this right now. Yeah, I've been saying that pop culture is going to be the thing that moves the needle toward mass adoption of Web3 when it comes to art or the idea of curation. I think that Archive's doing a really good job of not just being like, oh, well, we're just going to have a digital picture of something. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. not taking it at face value, but really being able to tie in a very immersive experience, but exploring it with technology in a totally different way. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think there's two types. There's probably that's probably limiting, but there's there's at least two types of people in in crypto, right? And so you have this kind of well, it's a tinier screen than I thought. My hands are out here, but I'm gonna tuck it in. <laughs> and we're scaling. You know, you've got people on the right side and the left side of of, of humanity broadly, right? And you've got Maybe 10 million people who have ever, you know, really interacted heavily with crypto on side. They have a lot of opinions on why they probably came in through speculation and financialization and these things. Then you have people on the left side who might have, you know, a Coinbase account that they got a couple years ago. They bought a few Bitcoin. They've been watching it, you know, but they go about their lives, etc. And very few moments have they had to overlap. Um, nor has a killer app shown up where it's affected their daily life, right? There hasn't been a moment where you're like, because I had this NFT, 
something changed in a way that I care about. That's probably access, events, uh, cultural significance, education, some kind of value that you know, historically you would have uh, you know, as ascribed something to. And I look at you know, pop culture broadly and what we're looking at as, as almost, it's almost like low hanging fruit it just, it's just, we started with the hard problems. We started with this, like, we're going to recreate the financial system when it was like, you know, like art was right there and like real estate is right there. There's like a lot of things that, that probably even lend themselves more cleanly to this that people didn't start from. And when I think about, you know, describing something to my uncle at Thanksgiving, you know, I could try to explain DeFi staking yield farming of a pickles into yams, you know, like... Or I could say, you know, you could have, you know, you could help come together with a bunch of people and you love Rolling Stones memorabilia. And, you know, you could call one of your best friends who owns a ton and we could work with them to put some of that into our collection and we'd all vote on what piece to have. Then you could have a say over it and we could put it out in the world and see it. And this would be very hard to do in any other format. And then we can do a lot from that because it starts on chain. That's exciting. You're talking about things that have like mile markers and like historical points in their past that they can lean into. Um, and I think that onboards the next, or probably the first, to be honest, billion people, um, because you're piggybacking on things that they've already proven, uh, you know, work across cultures and interests and using that as the hook to show why value can be created through this process. And that's, that's kind of how it's always worked on like technological 10 year cycles. Um, and so you need that adoption. You need to find things that, that people want to deal with. And I think that could be a moon man, you know? <laughs> Yes, definitely. That is how I communicate through pop culture and through yeah. kind of this shared language, through the shared knowledge of various references and being able to feel like you ultimately belong and are part of something. That's truly why I do anything. And I think that culture is a great lens to view that through. Everyone's kind of looking for that sense of belonging or a place that they might fit in or they're looking for a message that resonates with them. And this is a great way to, I, I think you described it perfectly, where you can explain it to someone in a, me in a way that they can understand and that message can be received because you are actually meeting people where they are, but at the same time, you're saying it in a way that that generates that spark, that bit of interest to be like, that actually sounds very interesting and now I want to learn more. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I told you this a little bit ahead of time on this call while we were just discussing before we hit record, but, you know, my degree, I, I had a degree in audio engineering, you know, for about four years of my life, I ran a small record label and a music studio and I was always obsessed with like pop music broadly and you know, however you see that, I think pop music at some point it was rock, at some point it was disco, at some point it was dance, it was voguing, it was, you know, it's indie pop, it's rap, it's all these things. I think pop is a, a, a moniker that evolves. Um, but the thing that kind of unifies it is that it's, it's this thing where a couple people sit in a room and they come up with something that when it exits that room in the little musical audio package, it goes out into the world and suddenly billions of people hear it <laughs> And it resonates with them. Maybe it resonates with them for a moment or a time. It captures a sound or a feeling or a mood of whatever. But when those things come together, when those waveforms come together and they hit people's ears, it, it works. And I always tell people, I'm like, everyone likes to sort of stratify music into, you know, their, you know, the classical or jazz or blah, blah, blah is different than hip hop and, and dance and EDM or whatever. And I'm like, I, I think Beethoven was just was just Drake, you know, back then, like, yes. these were, you know, this stuff existed, you know, like they were sending out sheet music and people would go and play it. And well, what's the newest symphony? Like this already happened just because it was at the moment, the thing that uh, now historically you look back as impactful. I think you'll now see the same significance. People have certainly moved into thinking about things like the Beatles now, which were controversial at the time, a bunch of long haired British guys show up and, you know, American women swoon, like, what is this? And you're like, well, now it seems tame. And you can literally recognize how so much other things have, uh, so much other music has pulled from that and, and, and used that and the roots that come from those different pieces. So I always look at pop culture as this incredibly unifying force. And it does it with language, but it also does it with all kinds of different pieces, color and symmetry and sound and, and what, and how do you participate in things? And 
And I look at that as, as you can think of those as symbols. There's usually physical symbols and represented, like representation of those times that everyone can bond against. And that's, you know, that's what nostalgia is to me. It's this like, you know, what are these moments? What are these artifacts? What are these things that relate back to a time where you're like, oh, I get that. I remember being there. I remember what that felt like. I think Archive can do a good job of, of, of surfacing those across a pretty wide array of, of, of interests and verticals. Definitely. And what you've described too, I love referring to as the cultural zeitgeist. And mm. whenever someone's like, wait, what does zeitgeist mean? What is that word exactly? I'm like, okay, if I say, if I bring together a combination of colors and textures and yeah. languages, okay, so neon and aerosol hairspray and heavy metal and hair bands like you're gonna know I'm talking about the 80s and no yeah. other decade and to be able to even if popular music can show up in totally different forms I think it's so beautiful how all of these pieces come together in time to form just such a unique composite that is just very representative of the tastes the mood and society at the time there's there was a project it might have been five or six years ago it might have been 10 because life is moving quickly <laughs> I, in my head it's five years ago I'm probably going to google this after and we'll be like oh that was 2011 it was called everything is a remix um, and it was a great sort of you know let's call it early-ish YouTube days um, maybe it was even Vimeo project where a person was looking at everything is a remix through different lenses though so through music through art through fashion and you know you can pretty much look at things and tie them to hey, you know, neon was a thing then, then neon disappeared, then neon came back, and, you know, uh, camo was a thing, and then camo disappeared, and then camo came back. Sampling old soul, like soul music existed, and then we sampled soul music, and then we got rid of sampling soul music, and now we're sampling soul music again. Like, things roll in these, in these circles across all these different spheres, so you never really, like, culture, when something hits, you never really lose it. It just becomes the you know, the, the, the roots of new pieces. And every now and then something completely new happens and everyone, you know, rushes to, to pile in and clone it or whatever. But even in the new, when you talk to people who create new, they'll tell you, you know, you know I had this inspiration looking at something else. You know, they'll say, you know, this was a, this was a moment that was very different uh, because I went to something and saw something. I have a really weird, I'll try to make it short anecdote. <laughs> uh, so after... I was in music, I went into uh, mobile and, and iPhone apps, and we developed a game that was called Karabi. No one has played this game, it doesn't really matter, um, but it was a match three game with little dots, little colored dots on a white, on a background of white. One week after we launched Karabi, a game called Dots came out, which became a massive hit. It was a giant successful casual game in around 2012, and we were just like, how did someone create the same game? Like we looked at it, and it was like, this is the same thing. We'd never met. They were in Brooklyn. We were in San Francisco. They, you know, success regardless. It was just, who knew? I finally met the guys three years later. And I was like, hey, we made Karabi, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, it was a great game. And I was like, yeah, Dots was incredible. I was like, what was your process for it? And he was like, well, we went to the Met and there was a touring show of a Damien Hurst art where it was colored dots that he had painted on a giant canvas, and we had thought about moving the dots around and what it would look like to make a game. I called my co-founder and was like, hey man, what was your inspiration for dots? And he was like, well, there was this Damien Hirst exhibit that was at the SF MoMA, and when I saw it, I thought, what if I could move these dots around? So the actual impetus for this thing was still tied to a moment where two people saw pieces of art that were traveling uh, a U.S. tour roughly at the same time that inspired a completely different type of creation in a totally different format that still went out to the masses in a different way um, through, you know, a, a, a central seed moment. And I think that is, you know, that's kind of the power of like creativity and pop and art and, and how those things come together. And I've always thought about that. I, I think about it all the time, like there's probably a seed somewhere and you're all, and other people are seeing it. And where does that come from? And it's, it, I think it's amazing. I think it's one of the things humanity excels at. I love how people can have an interpretation of something. I, I took an art history course mm. in college, and that was the main point that was always driven was to be able to look at a piece of art and make an interpretation from it, and not just be like, okay, we're at a museum. I looked at everything. Bye. 
but to really see what resonates, what doesn't. And instead of looking at dots on, on a canvas and saying the age old phrase, like, Oh, I could do that. Or I could draw that. It's like, yeah. Okay. Could you paint that? Cause if you could, why isn't your painting in the museum right now? Yeah. No, it's like when people watch the Olympics on TV and they're like, I could do that. It's like, you're sitting on your couch right now. You could not be in the Olympics, but if you you could have started Facebook, you would have started Facebook. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Yeah. Like keep telling yourself that if that makes Mm -hmm. you feel better. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's such an interesting story and seeing how all of these pieces, whether it's the technology or the culture or the art, they all tie together. And you've been playing games for a long time. You had mentioned that you love the 16 bit video game era. And I literally had to look that up to find out exactly what that meant. And (laughs) it's the fourth generation of video game consoles from about 1987 to 1994. And one of the games that they mentioned was mortal Kombat, which Mm. I have played many times because I remember the, um, the game would be in the car dealership. So if we had to go to the car dealership and you would just have to wait there as a child for what seemed like 20 hours of the day, you would at least have something to entertain you. So tell me about your, you know, where your love for the games came into play and and how that kind of influenced your path forward. So I... Uh, it, it started the era before, which is even almost more interesting. So I, in kindergarten, I had a close friend. His name was Chris Ranjit. And Chris Ranjit's dad had a conversion van. <laughs> New Jersey, 1989, probably, maybe 1990. He had a conversion van, and it was like one of those vans that you could sleep in. And it was like, I thought this was the coolest thing ever. And it had a TV in it. Like, if you were in the back of the conversion van, it had a TV. And in there, they had a Nintendo. And like an original wow. Nintendo. And I would want to go over my friend's house to play Nintendo in his van. I didn't have a Nintendo <laughs> at the time. And I, I, one of my weirdest, oldest, saddest probably memories in, hist- in like hindsight was that he was my best friend. And we went on a camping, we went on a field trip. And on the way there, I got to ride in his car with a bunch of friends when we played Nintendo. And on the way back, the school said, no, you got to go in a different car. You got to go to something and, and, and we're going to give other kids a chance to do that. And I was like, but he's my best friend. Why am I not riding with my best? Friend? It was a whole thing. But I always loved playing games and it was like an impetus for these types of like, these types of moments. And in, I want to say, second grade, uh, my family cut a deal with me that if I got straight A's and one B plus for a whole year, at the end, I would get a Super Nintendo and... I, you know, uh, this was highly motivating for me and I did it and I, I didn't, the, the, that back then your report cards got mailed home. So my parents had already found out that I had gotten the right grades. So I come home on the last day of school and I'm waiting and, you know, did I get this blah, blah, blah. And I go in my room and it's set up that, you know, there was a, I had, there's a TV in my room and a super Nintendo and was playing super Mario world, just the little intro where he jumps on Yoshi and they start eating the little plants, plant monster guy. And it was heaven. I was like, this is the greatest, this is the greatest thing ever. And I just, I would play for hours and hours. And I was an only child. Um, I stuck to myself a lot. I stayed in my room a lot. Um, and so video games were just like a, an outlet of fun and enjoyment um, that were also kind of stimulating. It was like, this is a thing. It was challenging. Games back then were harder than they are today much harder like games used to have instruction manuals games don't even have instruction manuals anymore they kind of teach you through the gameplay back then if you didn't have an instruction manual you would have no idea what you were doing and the whole idea was that they couldn't do a lot they couldn't fit a ton in those old games because they were limited by you know just literally ram and the memory it wasn't like you had huge hard drives so they had to create value through challenge (laughs) so you know you might have an eight level game but it would take you thousand times to beat those eight levels versus now you know you'll have a 34 hour game but you'll beat it in 34 hours like anyone capably can show up and learn to play so that was challenging back then i always found a real reward in like beating those things and that that sort of passion stuck with me um i think of that as like formative to some of like my my long-term behaviors it also made me interested in 
computers and and why does this signal hook up to this TV and and I bought all these little accessories and I you know and that's and that that became a thing. Also when I had friends come over we played video games. We played Mortal Kombat, we played Street Fighter. My dad didn't like other games, like lots of games, but he liked the fighting games. So that was like a thing we played together, you know. That those were fun. He understood the intuitive nature of like this is your left hand, this is the right hand, this is the left foot, this is the right foot. That all made this is a block. Like that all made sense. Um so yeah, it was just a big part of that time. And I found as I got older, similar to the nostalgia side of it all, you, I, I wanted to have those again. Like they became symbols. I started wanting to collect those and get those cartridges, not even to play. They became in my head like art and collectibles. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that, that's kind of how that passion came. That was a long story, I'm sorry. But I am really excited no, about No, I'm learning years. from you. And I find my favorite thing is listening to people talk about things that they love and that they enjoy. Yeah. And so that's it for me. And even I think that when we talk about any kind of formative experience, everyone has them, right? So it's like, as you're mentioning the games and like hanging out with your friends, I'm like, wait, I remember I went to a sleepover at a friend's house and they were playing Mario Kart. And that was the first time I ever saw Mario Kart and was like, wow, everyone wants a turn to play this. But even if you weren't playing and you were just watching, you were eating popcorn and it was just a whole thing. And you can just anything having to do with friendship, I have like such a soft spot yeah. for. And with, you know, whether you're playing a game keeping to yourself or whether it's something you can share with your friends or share with your family, I think that it it genuinely has meaning. And it's interesting how you mentioned kind of like the memorabilia. First of all, I'm like, should I just switch back to a flip phone? Probably. <laughs> I kind of want to, yeah. even just for a week and do it as a social experiment. But just also to feel hanging up on someone again. Just, just to that. be able to snap the phone shut. I really want to do that. Yeah. And um I read an article recently that talked about how Gen Z wanted to bring back flip phones, et cetera. So I'm thinking to myself, I read all of these different articles about the nostalgia for Web One and why we're all obsessed with the early internet and this and that. And those articles resonate with me, but I was like, wait a second. I went on a quest last week to find out my first original ringtone on my Virgin Mobile little phone. It was even before flip phones. And of course, everything's on YouTube now. So there's literally a review. Someone goes, I bought this uh, Verizon, not Verizon, Virgin Mobile phone from 2004. And they, it's a over a 10 minute video and they're going through every step. And I'm like, that was my cell phone. And then he plays all the ringtones. And I'm like, this is what I live for, being able to be like, what was my first ringtone again? And then yeah. being able to find it. I'm not going to go and buy that phone, probably. But there was one piece of memorabilia that I really did want to buy that I finally got recently. It is my um, Twitter banner picture, and it's of Spice Girls Lollipops. I finally found them on eBay five original unopened and then wow. also five opened with no lollipop just the packaging so I'm like those opened ones that can become a DIY project we can make things for the home the, the possibilities are just still endless yeah I, I mean phones in and of themselves are just interesting you know they they they're they were in your hand. They opened up everything, especially depending upon your your age range, right? Like I'm firmly in that like elder millennial line, right? So it's like I was handed a cell phone, didn't wasn't born with a cell phone. I grew up having to call friends and remember numbers. By college, we started, you know, cell phones started to show up. It a dramatic change in freedom. Suddenly people could get you and like, but I remember the switch vividly. I remember that opening up um, and 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 how that all changed. And you know. Even relationship to phone numbers. I know that sounds crazy. So I had a, I had a Casio uh, smartwatch. Again, again, showing the levels of nerdery here. If anyone was wondering, like I had a, you know, I was eighth grade. I had a Casio smartwatch that had the calculator and and the Indiglo. You could hit the button, it would make the blue screen. And it also had a phone bank. And I had everyone's phone numbers in my watch. And in in well massive overshare territory. I used to like, I had a crush on a girl and I would look at her number at night. 
and I would think about like, oh, I'm manifesting. I was trying to manifest. I'm gonna call her tomorrow, and like we're gonna see if she wants to hang out in downtown, you know, um, you know, over the weekend. And I would think, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. And I would think, oh, I did. I, I haven't talked to Brendan this week. I'm gonna call him. Like I would literally go through it and like think about who I could call, like how I was gonna have these moments. Um, and all of that ties together with this like feeling of um, of 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 connectivity that comes through the the this like shared love of both objects or communication platforms or where they come together and what do you get together and talk about you like when I hung out with we would talk about video games like when I hung out with, or we would talk about music or we would like you would talk about these things we would talk about maybe one day we'll go to that Spice Girls concert and maybe one day we'll go to that Hootie and the Blowfish concert or whatever it was like that's what you would talk about so these things call, all, all, all kind of flood through and I think you now look back on it and there is this feeling of like uh, it's funny, we, I was just talking about this with someone in, in archive, but you have this, as you as, as time goes on, you, you start, to, time condenses behind you, right? So it's like when you were a child, you know, a day and a week felt long to you. Now you probably think of your childhood as just like, oh, the time of my life between five and 12 or whatever. And you can probably, what ends up happening is you say, like, what were the key, you don't remember every day anymore, but you'd be like, oh, there was that trip to the museum when I went with my mom, there was that time I got the Super Nintendo, there was the calculator watch, like, I can think of my childhood through five or seven, probably various moments, and then there's objects that represent them. Hmm. All the days are, are gone, but it's like, and you want to, you're like, ah, oh, this will capture that, this was that feeling. And I think you can do that for every era of your life. There's things that I think about that tie to college, there's things that tie to high school, there's things that tie to my 20s, and where these things go, and and a lot of that is the nostalgia feeling comes from, you know, how do I symbolize those? What are the things for me? The objects. What are the what that show that that show those times? Maybe it's a giant Rockaware hoodie when I'm 21 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I do that now with my Spotify playlists. I love mm. curating playlists, and you know, if anybody has looked at my Spotify, you can see that if it's a playlist that's called high school or a playlist that's called college or a playlist that's called middle school dance it ages me immediately you can tell exactly what cultural zeitgeist I am a part of yeah. because when you hear these songs they're just from you know from the same three or four year span I even had a playlist that was of a one year span and really being able to look back because again I think I mean I love music so, so much. And I yeah. tend to remember details like that, like what year a song came out. But I have come to realize that most people are not like that. They'll be like, oh, yeah, that song came out in, you know, in high school, but it came out in, you know, seven years before that or whatever. Yeah. And so I think kind of that that historical accuracy, I think, is important, too, as we assign whether it's a song, whether it's an object, something that really just defines that zeitgeist for yeah. us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to place things in a time and then, because time is, time is context, right? And in any other thing, any other medium, that's further back, you would say, you know, maybe this is representation of the civil rights era, but this was 1967 and this is why this object mattered. Maybe this is representational of you know, uh, uh, World War II, but you'd say specifically this is an object that was in Normandy in, you know, 1943 or whatever. You, you would tie these things, you have to peg them, you have to anchor them. You know, I, I think someone once said that like the only thing humans ever actually invented is, is time and borders. Um, and so, but we did that because that's how we anchor things. <laughs> if we didn't have that, if we didn't have some concept of time, we wouldn't be able to place things in 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 our in a in in a in historical context, and then borders are kind of how we've defined location, and sometimes those are tied to natural boundaries. But we still say, you know, there's a different there's a line between Canada and the United States. There's a line between uh, you know, Germany and France, or Switzerland and Germany, or Italy and France. Like there's these lines exist, and we put them there. But then we can say this is from France in 1942. That tells you a lot. Suddenly you can tie in everything that you know about France, everything you know about 1942, what was going on in the broader world. Um, and I think that stuff matters. And it matters just as much in you know near, near past nostalgia 
if you're trying to understand and gauge those things. You know, when you said you had your first cell phone and it was 2004, I immediately was like, I had my first cell phone in 2001. So I'm like, I'm like, I, I can pretty much gauge that we're probably three years or so apart in, in when we were handed those and give or take a year and like what, what was probably the difference there. And I started thinking, I was like, did she, my, my first thought was like, did she have to print out MapQuest directions or not? Or did she, like, that's what I immediately start thinking of maps. And, like, when you had to go somewhere, did you, did you, and I want to know, did you carry mm-hmm. around printouts from MapQuest? So, you know how I learned MapQuest? Because they started teaching it in my middle school computer class. So I'm in seventh grade, and yeah. we are printing out maps. And I remember... Because GPSs were around when I was in high school, but I didn't get my own GPS until, I don't know, I was 19 or so. Because I think finally by that point, my parents are like, okay, please stop getting lost and calling us, telling us you're lost and making us go on the computer to print you out directions because you're lost. It's not like computers didn't exist in school or that we didn't have computer class, but I think that MapQuest was a great example of just a way where it became a really practical use case in your actual life. Totally. It was the last real need for a printer. Like once we didn't need MapQuest anymore, very rarely do you have to print things anymore. But MapQuest made printers critical because suddenly you had, the killer app for the printer was not reports in school, it was MapQuest to me. I was like, Mm -hmm. oh, if if I'm out of paper, how am I gonna get to the ball game? Like how am I gonna get to the concert? How does this work anymore? I don't have an atlas in the back of my trunk anymore. And I yeah. think of all those moments and 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 I, I, I don't know if we're accelerating. It feels like cycles are accelerating. It feels like the, you know, the the map era was long. My parents mm. had maps in their cars from, you know, the 70s to the 90s. The MapQuest era was short. The GPS era was almost was probably like the actual physical GPS era was probably almost shorter because but once phones had capable GPS it was done. They took out an entire 80 years of other technology disappeared. And the reason it took it is because you were having to call your parents to print out MapQuest on the same device. We might as well use this thing in front of us. And it's weird to talk about nostalgia through like of that. But like, I remember my backseat was full of map of old printouts and people would get in my car <laughs> to clean your backseat. I'm like, yeah, it's just, I don't want to print this again. And I might forget. So it's like, this is just how I get to school or this is how just weird feelings around, you know, even paper printouts and the, the act of going through those things and how that's changed so dramatically. Yeah. I even said, I think to my sister recently where I was, I could not remember the actual word for an encyclopedia. I was like, okay, remember those, it's like Wikipedia, but how you literally had books. She's like encyclopedia. I'm like, exactly. Like who, like we had those. And I I talk a lot about the monoculture and how now there's just so many different ways that you can access information. But at the same time, people are always still looking for a sense of belonging and some kind of cohesive narrative or something they can feel a part of. And when you were writing a school report, if you were writing a school report about dogs, Whatever that encyclopedia that you had in your house said about dogs, if it said dogs fly, that's what you put in your report. And that was your one source of truth and information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's my source? Encyclopedia Britannica that my parents bought one a week for 52 weeks at the supermarket. Like that's like legitimately that's how I remember acquiring encyclopedias. There was these blue ones for kids. I think they were called like the Golden Golden Book Encyclopedia. And at the grocery store, they would every week for a year, there would be another volume. And I don't know why they chose that distribution method, but we would get the eggs and the bacon and the cheese and the whatever. And, I, and we'd get the next volume, uh, we'd get B. And then we'd get B2. And then we'd get C and C2, D and D2. S was like S123, S was big. Um, and you had these different volumes and like that was part of it and like Britannica you would, it was um, you could do it it was like a subscription it was like a mail thing you could buy the whole thing at once or you could get a, subs- a new one every month and you'd be on the Britannica uh, you know month club or whatever and how it worked and then Encarta came out Microsoft had this thing in Carta, and it was a CD-ROM that came bundled with all these computers in the 90s you bought Windows on your Packard Bell or your Dell or your Compaq Presario 
and Encarta was in it. And it was like, you had nothing else. You, when you got the computer, all you had was Solitaire and Minesweeper and Encarta. And I would, I would browse Encarta like it was a game. It's like, it had videos. I'd never seen it. The CD-ROM drive was loud. It was like, mm, 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 trying to play these videos off it. And it's like, oh, this is, a, this is what scuba diving is. I'm like, oh, look, at I'm transported to another world. I'm scuba diving. And I mean, the quality was terrible. It's just little tiny dinky videos. But even that, you know, that, you know, the, there was the encyclopedia and there was tomes and there was huge and they got smaller and then they showed up on a CD-ROM and then you had Wikipedia and you have the entire internet. Like, we just keep pushing through it, but I still feel something about it. I still remember those moments. I still remember the feeling of that. I still remember a big dictionary and seeing aardvark at the beginning and being like, that's a funny word. Like, I still think about uh, how that time happened. Um, there's like a lot of thoughts on, there's a lot of things in like neuroscience now around like neuroplasticity and a lot mm -hmm. of it is you want to change a habit or or learn something really well you want to actually tie it to a physical thing so you know if you want to break a habit you want to do something take a you know if you want to learn something do it while walking or go to a completely different place because your brain is now saying oh i've never sat on this bench before in this location so while you're doing you're learning something you're now also creating new pathways that your brain is naturally kind of putting that together. And I think about how in the past, everything was doing that. So reading a physical book and browsing, you were constantly doing it that way. Now all of my learning kind of comes from the same spot. All of my discovery, it's, I'm usually sitting in a chair staring at a screen. And I wonder mm. if that's dramatically decreasing our ability to like create nostalgia moments. Will, I, will people have the same feelings about, you know, that time something cool happened with their friends online as when it happened in the mall? I don't, I don't know. It'll just be different to see how that all plays out. Yeah. I love Chuck Klosterman and his yeah. most recent book, the nineties talks about the fact that we can't perceive the present until it is the distant past. And mm. I really like that idea mm. because it's very easy, even as trend cycles are, accelerating and kind of like the turnover of information and the the attention economy is just revving up continuously being able to be like okay how are we going to remember the 2020s like yeah. we don't know we're not going to know until it's long over and we are not going to know how we are going to create new nostalgic experiences when we're still so zoomed in but I even think it's interesting. I did an episode a little while ago called Why 2010's Nostalgia is Already Back because yeah. I think, too, TikTok loves to take things and, like, bring them back even sooner. And everyone's like, yeah. wait, I'm not ready. But when you really think about it, I mean, the 2010s were already – 2010 was already 12 years ago. And uh, I, that's kind of crazy. My most favorite and least favorite thing to do is – uh, you know, you hear a song uh, that you're like, oh, I love this song. This is my jam, right? And you say, when this song came out, how far, what would, what would the song have, what would the time distance song equivalent had been when this was cool for me? And it's like, all right, it's like, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, Kanye West, uh, Gold Digger or something, or, or you know, and like, okay, 2002, 2003, that's 20 years ago. When that came out, what it would have been like a 1982 song. You would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, Blondie or something, or Michael Jackson Beat It is the equivalent distance. Do you know how old Michael Jackson Beat It felt to me when I was 22 years old? I love it's a great song, not a problem, but that felt like it was like felt like forever. And I'm sitting here like, oh. Oh, I'm, li this is not, I'm listening to old music. Like I, <laughs> this is old stuff and it feels different to me. It feels modern. It feels like these people are still somewhat around, but I'm like, this is what people who told me Madonna felt super relevant to them, which, you know, in 2003 and they're like, oh yeah, Madonna's got a new album. I'm like, eh, I didn't care too much about that, but mm -hmm. it, it didn't feel long to them. It felt like they had just listened to Holiday a couple years ago. Cause that's how I feel when someone tells me, oh, you know, you listen to that T.I. song. Swagger like us? I'm like, that's not that old. No, it's 15 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, this was a long time ago. <laughs> These, that's yeah, such a phenomenon, a funny phenomenon. When you're like that, oh, remember when 1999 was 
10 years ago, it's like, mm, sorry to break it to you. <laughs> three years ago. The Y2K bug that was going to take down the whole world is, you know, we are like further from Y2K than Y2K was from like the creation of the internet. <laughs> it's like yeah it's like, that's what? crazy <laughs> it's you know like, what i saw the other day a tweet that was like okay share your this is when i felt old moment there were two times that i was just like not that oh i feel old but more so like whoa time has elapsed mm -hmm. one was where there's a dad that goes up to his wife and is like oh phone's ringing like gesture to pick up the phone and she goes okay and she picks up the phone okay then he goes to his kids who were teenagers and he's like okay phone's ringing pick it up and the kids go like this oh, yeah. and I was like whoa that's crazy and then the other one was another TikTok where this woman goes to liquor store this video came out in 2021 she shows the the clerk her ID and he just kind of like glazes over it and gives it back to her and she's like aren't you gonna like look at my ID to buy something and he's like well you know you were born in the 1900s and she was like <laughs> oh, oh so, yeah. and then and the just thinking about oh my God. Th thinking about the fact that one day being born in the 1900s is going to be like old people only and all the Kims and Jessica's and Ashley's are going to be grandma names. That's weird to me. I, and grandma names are wild, right? Because grandma <laughs> names are a whole thing. So grandma names are a perfect, this almost like puts a bow on a lot of the stuff we've talked about here, but grandma names are on like 40 year cycles. So there's a lot more, there's a lot of Naomi's being born now and all these things. And those, because everyone pays respects to their grandparents. And so you get mm. these grandma, like grandma and grandpa names move in these like bubbles. And you can literally go to like namechangertracker.com and you can see the cyclical nature of it. And it's a perfect example of that same thing. I also think about when you say things like the 1900s, it's like what will actually happen is remember when you were in school in, you know, whatever the nineties and you're taking history class like we will be the people, the people that were alive at the turn of the century. <laughs> we mm -hmm. will be, we're those people. Oh, what was happening at the turn of the century? Like, and that century will be, you know, 1995 to 2015 roughly. And you'll be like, oh, that, oh, we were the people that were alive at the, you know, the turn of the century. We're turn of the century people, which is That's like cool. the, the last, it's kind of cool, but the last turn of the century was also what was happening? Well, we figured out how to make a car. <laughs> it's like, we, we're the same people that were described at like, it's the same distance gap as that. I'm like, that's wild. I also, I will say for one thing, I do not feel, the old thing feels like a, like a weird trap. I think that's mm. a trap. Um, I also think there's a lot of difference, frankly, between what, a, like age now and what age used to be. Just from scientifically, just we're broadly healthier. We live longer. So it's like, you're not, you're not sort of, you're not as close to frankly like death as you were as, as when you were, you know, in your mid to late thirties or fifties or whatever, as you were, yeah. when you're looking at people in the seventies at that same space, we eat like, we don't smoke as much. Right? We don't look frankly as old. We have better men, like all these things. And then a lot of technological advancements have occurred that have accelerated things, but in a lot of the media ones, so a lot of the things you would judge sound or visual have not actually dramatic. The big leaps happened in our lifetime. So mm -hmm. when, uh, I'll give you a per, I'll give you a big one. So Alanis Morissette's "Jagged Little Pill," that is the first album that was recorded 100% digitally, like that a mainstream album. Like I'm sure some of them were small, but that was the first one released that went platinum, etc. Completely recorded with computers, digital. She didn't use tape. It was completely recorded on on that manner. Before that, everything was recorded to tapes. Like this mm -hmm. was still the sound. You would you would you know you cut pieces of tape. The, the sound, sound, you can hear things, they just sound older. When you hear stuff from the 80s and 90s, you don't, it doesn't really sound that different anymore. So the, like the, while the, the, the tonality, the intonation, the timbre of a, of a Spice Girls song sounds of the era, the quality doesn't sound dated. You could play it just as loud now. It doesn't, there's no, there's no hiss in the background from the tape. It, 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 like, you don't, it, it's, it wasn't first released on vinyl. It was released on a CD. It was always in digital quality. It sounds the same as a new pop song. Like BTS and Spice Girls were mastered basically the same way. So we have actually kind of, we had the big leap, 
things don't feel as old. Things used to feel older because they legitimately were using just significantly outdated. We're making big marginal increases. Like the move from standard definition television to HD was massive. I mean, it, you know, total huge mega difference. But the move from HD to 4K, it's crisper, but you're not, mm. it doesn't feel like, you know, and then 4K to 8K, which is the next one, it's not going to feel anything like it felt to go from, you know, a, a tiny little CRT television to a giant flat screen HD. We've made those big leaps. And you can, to, and even gaming, like a 16-bit game now looks like a certain way, but 16-bit gaming actually holds up because it was kind of artistry and there's a style, there's retro gaming comes out now. The stuff that doesn't hold up is actually like the PlayStation 1 era where they started doing 3D and it looks garbage now. Like it looks so, mm. you can't even play it. It looks so bad because 3D now looks so incredible. But a game from 2012 still looks pretty good today. People have been playing World of Warcraft for 20 years. Same game. People have been playing Grand Theft Auto V for 10 years. It's the number one selling game uh, in the world still. It does a billion dollars a year. It's 10 years old. We Things are starting to condense a little night. And I do feel like that is a that is a new trend where a lot of the the places that you would you would feel the the gaps have have started to um, compress a little. Yeah, and I love seeing emerging technology used in kind of like a retro or analog way as mm. well. And so you're seeing something that technically it's new, but it's reminiscent of a past time. And so you still have the quality that we kind of have grown to expect now. Yeah, it can still be nostalgic and fun without necessarily having any of like the the tech growing pains that we experienced then. And even I was watching a show relatively recently and they showed it was like they were at a football game. And so they showed live like real football footage from the yeah. from the 70s. And I said to my dad, I'm like, how did you watch sports back then? <laughs> like how it literally just looks like all green and a bunch of little smudges. And it was just a totally different experience. Yeah. I mean, and that is a, that is a, there's stories there, right? There was Dick Ebersol, uh, yep. NBC executive in the seventies and basically pioneered sports on television. He changed the entire way it was shot. It wasn't just a camera going like this, following a ball and a giant white, and you're just, no one knows. He was like, oh, we're going to make the announcers front and present. We're going to make, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to figure out how to do instant replay. We're going to change all these things. I personally find like NFL games, for instance, I, I, they're almost confusing to watch live if you've spent your entire lifetime watching them on television because it's better on TV, these things, it's better to have someone draw on the screen and tell you what's happening on the plays and, and get hear the exactly what's happening and the coaches stuff. That's why NFL became so massive because the world moved towards television and they nailed it and it outpaced baseball, which is very easy to consume and understand when you're in, in person and not much more exciting when you're at home versus mm -hmm. football at home is incredible. There's, and there's opposites. Hockey is hard to follow on TV, but incredible in, in person. So it's, I think that's kept hockey from being as big as it might actually be globally because it just isn't as great on television. Basketball is kind of good in both, which mm. is why like basketball, I think, has risen. But a lot of these are tied to you know the technological interpretations of how you view them uh, in the place you're most comfortable. And I think that that's part of this whole thing. Even to tie it to the Web3 and all the stuff we're talking about, I think thinking about how you'll view things physically and how we'll place things out in the world, but also how can we educate and talk about these things and make an experience in, let's say, the metaverse of it all um, as well to bring objects into people's homes that they can learn about and experience without having necessarily the ability to go see them uh, and experience them that way. It's, it's a new challenge as technologies merge around these things. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions as okay. we kind of wrap up one of them. Okay. You collected nineties basketball cards. Yeah. Who was, who are your favorite? If you had to pick a top, top, maybe three players. Yeah. So uh, rapid fire. Uh, I was obsessed with Penny Hardaway back then. And you know, like the Penny Hardaway rookie card was the one I wanted the most. Uh, it was probably Penny Hardaway, Grant Hill. And I always loved, uh, uh, Michael Jordan broadly still throughout the 90s. That was obviously the the, the focal point. Um, so those would always have been my... And every time I got one of those, 
I would take them out of the sleeves. Out. Those would always be framed in a little slab box. I would always take, regardless of price, I was like, oh, I'm going to showcase my Penny Hardaway ones. I love that. Yeah, when I say rapid fire, I mean say your answer with context because okay. I find that I'm very bad at rapid fire. I can't just yeah. say one word and move on. I'm like, do you not want to know the rest of the story? Because yeah, I'm going to tell it to you. Tell you a little bit about why I like it. Cool. Um, did you have a slap bracelet when you were a kid? Not only did I have slap bracelets, I, I would tell everyone that my mom was my first angel investor because her she had a kid in her class. She was a teacher that would do, could do, do bubble letters, and he would draw bubble letters, and slap bracelets were trending in my school, and she bought snap bracelets for me. I would take name requests from kids in my school. She would bring them to the kid in her class. He would get 25 cents. I would get 25 cents. He would draw the names in bubble letters, and I would sell them in, <laughs> sell them to the kids in my class for 50 cents or something. I think it might have been 75 cents or a dollar, but we had a little profit margin. My mom bought them. I love slap bracelets. And when I do talks randomly for like things, I always go on Amazon, buy big bags of them, and I like throw them out into the crowd when I talk about the slap bracelet stuff. Yeah, I think slap bracelets were amazing. And now like they're dangerous now. Like you're not supposed to give them to kids. They like they got metal and she, I was like, oh. Yeah, God. they're like an improvised weapon. Yeah, it's a whole thing. I was like, man, everyone's gotten pretty soft here. But yeah. you're like, this is why we can't have nice slap bracelets. You can't have nice slap bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, you're a fa- I was more of a in the '90s, more of a Snapple girly myself. But mm. you're a Nantucket Nectars guy. If you were to write a fact, what would it say? Oh wow, um, this is fun. Uh, there are uh, a mall in New Jersey is the best place in the world. Wow. Okay. You know what? I'm not going to disagree with that because I grew up in Connecticut and I have family in New Jersey. And I remember one day when I was in high school, we spent the entire day. We went to Paramus Park, Garden State Plaza and Willowbrook Mall all in one day. And it was like, you know, I was, yeah, 16 or so. And it was just the most fun day ever. It was the first time I ever went to the Cheesecake Factory. Mm. And... It was just a beautiful day. And I'm like, New Jersey, I think, must have the most malls per capita in any state in the United States. And I love that about it. It's, it's, uh, you've got the shore and a mall. And that's kind of where people in New Jersey meet. <laughs> yeah. And so I love that. And, um, I would agree with that. What are your favorite museums in the world? Uh, I, there's an amazing museum. I'm going to butcher its name in Vienna. Um, it's, it's like Konstutschis. I can't quite pronounce it. Um, that's just fantastic. You can wander it forever. It's just huge and old, and it feels uh, important um, just walking through it. And then uh, I still will always have a fondness for the Met in New York. That's sort of where I first went to a museum. I love the like the, the sorry, I call it the Egypt room. I think it's actually like the Temple of Dender. But there's this amazing room in there that it just teleports you into a different feeling. And there's water and the temple and glass and Cleopatra's Needle outside. And I just, uh, I love it. Those are, those are happy places. Yeah. I went to the, the Modern Art Museum in Stockholm and mm. there was a Warhol exhibit there. And when I was growing up, Oh my God, I was an Andy Warhol stan, so obsessed. And then as you get older and you learn more about the context of the time and the person and their, the kind of role that these artists played in their world, I thought it was super interesting because he really looked at pop culture and you're like, wait, is this satire? Wait, is he, is he, is this meta? Is he self-referential? Is he kind of making fun of the very thing that gave him a platform. And I think that that's so relatable to social media and how culture is nowadays. Um, And actually there was also a contemporary art museum in Lisbon. That is my favorite. And there was my favorite sculpture is a Dali. It's called Mm. um, aphrodisiac telephone. And it's like a lobster as the receiver on a rotary telephone and just seeing that with 
Klaus Oldenburg with Warhol all in the same place. I'm like, this is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I'll be in Lisbon in a few weeks. I will make sure I go there. You, you need to go there. It's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This has been great. I, I think we just hang out and talk about nostalgic things anytime you want. This was fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Thanks again. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye. That's a wrap for this week. If you like Nostalgia, please connect with me on social. Subscribe to the Nostalgia newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com and follow, rate, review on your platform of choice. Everything's linked in the show notes, including where to find more about our guest of the week. Thank you so, so much for your support. And that was this week's episode of Nostalgia. Yeah.